Hi friends, welcome again to another episode of uh, Beyond the Clouds, Edge to Edge Transformation. And to me, it's a joy talking to people who I consider are luminaries in the industry who are shaping the future. Um, and Anna Katrina is one of the few people I'm talking to for the first time, but I've heard about her, I've seen her work in the industry for a very long time. So Anna, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've been sure. up to lately. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Anna Shedletsky. I'm CEO and one of the founders of a company called Instrumental. I'm a mechanical engineer by training. I have two degrees from Stanford. Um, was really interested in this idea of building perfect things. I thought that was maybe possible coming out of school. You know, we all were all a little naive in the beginning. Um, and I thought like Apple was an interesting place to build, to learn to build perfect things. And um, I quickly found out that even Apple cannot build perfect things. It's just very, very difficult. Execution is very hard. Um, but I was at Apple for six years where I uh, led product design for a handful of iPod programs. And then for the first generation Apple Watch, uh, I then left Apple to start Instrumental Again, still interested in this idea of perfection and how we could leverage data and AI uh, essentially to eliminate the 20 cents of every dollar spent in manufacturing that is wasted. That's a lot. Uh, are you saying that 20% uh, is wasted? And uh, if so, where is it wasted? And is there something that can be done to minimize this wastage? Yeah, so when I'm talking about the waste, so this this statistic actually comes from Bain and Company. Um, so I didn't just make it up. And actually, 20% is on the low end. <laughs> I think they actually talk more like 20 to 40%. Um, and so when we talk about it, we pick the low end, we feel it's the most defensible. But this is uh, a, a comes from all different facets of waste. You might have immediately thought of like, oh, like a big pile of like stuff that doesn't get shipped. Yes, that's part of it. There's physical waste involved. But we're also talking about economic waste. So this is the lost opportunity of being able to ship those products. We're talking about machine down time and OEE. Um, we're talking about line downtime and the human hours wasted uh, in these processes to bring products to market or even during production. And so scrap, rework, repair, um, all of these things, mistakes and experiments that engineers make as part of uh, the development process that then ultimately have to get worked out. Um, there's many sources of this waste. It represents $8 trillion annually um, across the manufacturing space. And I was particularly, again, with this kind of idea of like perfection in manufacturing, I was really interested in um, seeing if I could come up with ways to eliminate some portion of this waste. Um, and, you know, during my time at Apple, I got to see a lot of that waste happen Um in like firsthand and some of the reasons it happened as well as the ways in which we as engineers would try to respond when those issues came up and our first response was always really around getting data and so that's why to me it seemed like data was going to be the key to unlocking um, improvements in efficiency and building systems that could essentially eliminate this waste wow i had no idea of the extent to which wastage happens. Uh, so what's the role of AI? How would AI and machine learning reduce this kind of waste? And what has been your yeah. approach at Instrumental? Yeah, so um, since a lot of your audience is um, in the semiconductor space, I'm gonna make maybe some analogies there um, because I do think that semiconductor is a lot further ahead in um, the use of data and closed loop systems to optimize manufacturing in a way that like has not rolled down to other parts of the industry. Um, and I think that's because in semiconductor, you can't even make like one chip if you don't use advanced process control and measure all this data, and it's just so difficult. Um, but in consumer electronics or even mission critical electronics or medical devices, you can often make one unit, um, even if you have to put in a lot of, of units to get that one. Um, so it's kind of an easier problem. Uh, and yet, like the kind of data that you might take for granted as a semiconductor engineer coming off of all your equipment 
is like few and far between in other electronics manufacturing or downstream from Sony, like in the um, in the electronics, like kind of box build area. And a lot of it, you, you might think about like printed circuit boards. Well, these are like done by machines. So there's certainly opportunity for optimization there. You could plug in, but they don't. Uh, and then even downstream from that, you go on to the workshop floor, which is literally people with screwdrivers and stuff. So how are you going to apply advanced process control in a workshop with so many people? And so the opportunity uh, for instrumental is essentially to use the the traditional concepts of manufacturing optimization, which is where you understand your inputs, you understand your outputs, you try to build transfer functions between your inputs, make the changes to your inputs to get the outputs that you want, um, and you implement those, but essentially enabling software systems to do that constantly, autonomously, um, to optimize manufacturing process. And so for instrumental, we grab data from the inputs um, and the outputs. So in the part of the the part of the supply chain that we operate in, which is essentially final assembly, some sub-assembly, but where we're components, big parts of the components are going together. Um, we are we're grabbing the data the inputs for us tend to be the geometries so what did the part look like at key states of assembly or the or the assembly what did it look like how are things aligned and then the outputs tend to be things like measurements or performance test information how did the antenna perform how did the speaker perform and all of the parametric data that comes out of these testers that are on 100 percent of lines um but as often those testers are off on their own little islands and are just giving kind of pass fail results but there's signal in that data and so the benefit of ai is not only i mean what we do is aggregate the data but the benefit of ai is like to take that data and to parse through it to surface things that are useful and interesting for the human engineers who are trying to find and fix issues as part of the development process or to run continuous improvement activities to improve yield or margin or quality in production. And so the AI is a very important piece that takes a ton of data and tries to collapse that into, you know, what they call in the industry as insights, although I, I kind of hate that word because it's just like very nebulous what that means, um, but essentially into things that humans then can use to actually take action uh, on the line to change the inputs to get the outputs they want. That's wonderful. In fact, uh, when when we hear about automation using machine learning, AI, uh, I believe that that's going to transform and create more jobs. But there's always that concern that a lot of the work that you're describing is done manually or very laboriously, and those kinds of jobs may go away. Uh, what do you see happening in the uh, in the manufacturing sector? There's a lot going on, but in general, there's not enough people to meet the demand uh, of the manufacturing space. People aren't really going into manufacturing. Um, so at every level, at the operator level of the person screwing in the screws, um, you know, I'm including low cost labor countries as well as high cost of labor countries like the U.S. Um, and then all the way up the chain, the number of engineers, the number of people with expertise in the different equipment, robotic systems, software systems. There's just like not as many people going into manufacturing, um, but it's half of the world's gross world product. <laughs> so it's like a, it's a big industry and it's an exciting industry. There's useful, there's useful and interesting things going on here. So if you're interested in it, you should come join us, the manufacturing industry. But yes, in general, um, there's not enough people. And so it's not even really a question of like, is this replacing a job? It's like, actually, please replace this job because there's nobody sitting in the seat. Um, there's also many of the kind of jobs that are being, um, that are kind of most um, ripe for disruption with automation tend to be the jobs that humans are just really not good at. And they're not great jobs. Um, and there's there's all sorts of other areas in which a human can provide more value in the manufacturing process. So I was talking to a prospective customer a couple months ago who um, manufacturers in the US, they make very specialized parts for the aerospace industry and they just can't hire enough people. And so it's really important to them that they don't ship any bad parts to their to their customers, because again, aerospace, mission critical, um, and <laughs> this part's got to work. And so they have multiple inspectors on the line doing a job that humans are actually really not great at. We're very bad at doing long-term kind of inspection of parts. Our brains shut off. We're, we're bad at it. 
Um, but that's so important that they put people there, but it means they have a whole like input line and machines to operate that there's no one to operate. And so removing essentially inspection jobs, enable them to take those people and go put them in revenue producing jobs um, for the organization. And uh, it's something that that was driving the automation for them. I think there's a big movement right now, particularly with the tax incentives that the current administration has put in place for manufacturing to actually do some manufacturing within the U.S. or in greater North America, including um, Mexico. It's kind of having a resurgence. And so there's just a lot of um, ways in which we can do that manufacturing in a more efficient way um, with high ROI. And it's it's not about replacing jobs. It's actually about creating jobs because those jobs didn't exist in the U.S. prior to bringing some of that manufacturing back or establishing it here in the first place. Anna, you remind me that I started my career as a product engineer and um, I got burned out within two years. It was amazing. AC characterization, process characterization, optimization so that we could get the best 486 and Pentium chips out. And it was a remarkable success. But at the same time, inspecting, ensuring that the defect permillion and the power consumption and remember that Pentium bug that was became highly publicized. One little Pentium bug cost the company half a billion dollars. So I, I'm totally with you. There were there are now more product engineering jobs than ever before, and automation is a must. Uh, in those days when I was in engineering, product engineering, there were no women on the shop floor, even on testers and all that. It's a delight to see that the scene has changed. When you got into the industry at Apple and later at Instrumental, has the scene changed a little bit? Do we see more diversity in terms of women participating in semiconductor in manufacturing? So I think there's kind of a lot of different angles to look at it. Um, so I'll tell you a story. When I, um, so I, I graduated from um, Stanford in 2009, which is a rough time to graduate into the market with like no experience. Um, I graduated in 2009 and I thought, um, you know, oh, I'm going to go like be an engineer, a mechanical engineer. I'm going to go be an engineer somewhere. And I interviewed in a lot of places and I was really surprised actually, um, because I was coming out of a program that was at worst, like 30% women, maybe it was 40% women. So like, I, I didn't notice like a significant skew, but then I started interviewing at companies and like readily noticed that there was a significant skew. Um, and, uh, you know, like bad behavior abounds in terms of interviewers being like, so you're a woman and you want to do engineering. Like, what? This is like 2009. Like, didn't this like stuff happen like decades ago? Don't I have like the previous generation of women to thank for the sexual revolution? And it's kind of like hadn't happened in some of these companies. Um and I, you know, I think that like there's different companies, different challenges, different groups um, in inside Apple. Um, it is true that my particular group uh, was very male dominated. I think I was in a group that were 70 people reporting to one VP where there were only two women when I was hired. Um, They're all mechanical engineers. I think that was more of a cultural challenge of that particular group and the type of archetype fit that they were looking for in terms of personality. Um, tended more towards uh, men, I think, than women. Uh, however, over time, that group did change its demographic. And there's certainly other groups at Apple that are you know, much closer to 50-50, even engineering groups that are much closer to 50-50. It was just kind of an interesting like little, little um, microcosm, I guess, a microculture there. And it changed over time while I was there. I um, certainly was very interested in how we could have more women join, more people from different backgrounds. However, when I went to China for the first time, which is part of my job, um, I was delighted to see that like in China, uh, where we're manufacturing at the factory at all levels. So not just, you know, folks working on the line, but also the, the line leaders, inspection, quality engineers, all, like process engineers all the way up. It just seemed like there was a much more equal split um, and much more, uh, uh, yeah, an equal split between men and women there, which was very interesting. And actually line leaders were more likely to be women, it seemed, um, for some reason. <laughs> uh, we're more likely to be women. But anyway, um, so it did always seem to me like manufacturing had a good mix. Um, 
And certainly diversity in the development and design of products is absolutely paramount to making sure products are designed for all. Uh, and a really good example of that um, is when I was working on the first generation Apple Watch. Uh, well, there's a product that you wear and needs to go on your body and men and women's bodies are different. <laughs> uh, and prior to the Apple Watch, all of the smartwatches on the market were like these ginormous because it was just really hard to do the miniaturization. So they were just like ginormous. And I have a I have a fifth percentile female wrist. Um, so I'm small. Uh, and uh, I remember being called into the industrial design group. There was also a woman on that team in industrial design at, at Apple who also had small wrists. And they would put all the prototypes on their wrist and just be like, mm, couldn't work. And we also had like a leader who had like, really big like 95th percentile male wrists which big wrists and then you'd put all the devices on on his like the little prototypes and be like oh that doesn't work either um and so i think because there was a diverse team working on that product we ended up with two sizes um which was the first time i believe uh that uh, an electronic device what that you wear on your body was actually designed in two different sizes at the same time, not like the woman's product coming out years later, but at the same time, because of a, a strong like ethos that like, if you're going to wear it on your body, it like needs to make sense for your body. Um, and so it's very interesting. There's like, even as we thought about like the health sensors on that product, like how they work with like the hairiness level of this area of your body. Um, and that has gender differences as well. And even within the genders, like there's a wide range. Uh, so there's just a lot to like include. Um, and I actually think Apple did a great job of trying to cram that all into the first generation uh, go around to do the best we could to account for what is really the full range of population, different pigmentation in people's skin. Like we, try to learn from the mistakes of, um, you know, prior product releases to, to, to get it right. I think we did a, a strong job. So like, that's a, that's like an, an example for where diversity, like literally changes how a product can perform in the market and who, um, it has like an economic and economic benefits to the companies that, you know, employ the diverse population. So I'm glad that uh, people like you are contributing uh, not only to the diversity, but creating new products as well uh, that are necessary to uh, to cater to different market segments. Now, speaking of different markets, uh, manufacturing and efficiency is a problem, not only in physical objects, but even in the software industry. We talk about software factories. That's, that's never happened. It's all hacking. Do you see applications of what you're doing at Instrumental uh, could be used in say the software industry or in other spaces besides just manufacturing? Mm, interesting. So we've certainly borrowed heavily and taken strong inspiration from the software industry, particularly products that do observability and monitoring. So you can think about like the data dogs, new relics, sumo logics of the world um where you're monitoring like what is the we think about it from the perspective of like well of course you need to monitor your like cluster of servers so why are you okay like not monitoring your manufacturing line um so we've certainly uh taken a lot of inspiration from software in terms of other applications for the technology so instrumental's core technology is actually there's two things that is uh unique to what we do so we aggregate data, we do smart things with the data to deliver it to users in user-friendly ways that they can come in, they don't need to have like significant training to get value, it fits into the way that they work every day. That's kind of what we do. So the secret magic sauce is in the like, do smart things with the data. And there's kind of two specific things that we do. Um, the first is we are the best in the world at turning images into numbers that you can do statistics with is the way of kind of describing it. So one of the things that you can do with numbers is put them in a rank order. So what we can do is we can actually rank anomalies out of this population of thousands of units or even only 30 units. We can rank visual anomalies um, and enable visual search and visual correlation. Um, and so that's the other piece. Like since we, we turn it into numbers you can do statistics with, we can also do statistics with images, um, which is an interesting thing. Like what is a visual correlation? It's actually correlating um, parametric data 
to like the mathematical outputs of like a like an algorithm for an image and that lets us actually take um, an example would be oh this unit has an antenna performance issue or a speaker performance issue how does that correlate to all of the images i have and regions in the images where there may be differences and we can actually use that to essentially automatically pinpoint root cause um, so I talked about like our ambition is around optimization, enabling optimization, essentially, eventually in an autonomous way, lines that can improve themselves, improve their own processes. In order to do that, you have to be able to know what's wrong, know why it's wrong, implement a fix, and then validate the fix to kind of close the loop back and start on the next problem. You need to be able to do all of those things without people. Um, and so you know, identifying that there's an anomaly, that's kind of step one. So like our algorithms do that by um, ranking these anomaly scores and, and showing you anomalous images that could be defects. And then identifying root cause, that's what the correlations allows us to do and actually pinpoint to like, oh, this geometry is causing this functional defect or these two functional things are related. And that helps us to actually identify what could be uh, causing the problem. Making the change on the line today is still done by people on the line. Um, and then validating that it's fixed is something we support as well. So those are some areas um, in which like AI, the AI that we've developed has kind of bubbled out. So what's interesting about that is you asked about what other industries could leverage this technology. Certainly we occasionally, um, I actually, um, I'm a big science fair kid. I was a science fair kid. I'm a big science fair person. I have judged for about the last decade at the International Science and Engineering Fair. I'm, I sit on the National Leadership Council for the Society for Science that does the um, the national or the International Science and Engineering Fair. And um, I always see all of the, I judge in the like intelligent machines and robotics category. And I always see all of this machine learning applications to medical and looking at image, medical imagery, like pathology and that. And I think there's a huge opportunity. If we think about like inspection and instrumental essentially kind of does inspection of physical products. Uh, that's what pathologists do of like medical imaging. And for the same reason, humans are really bad at doing quality control checks at the end of the line. We're just like really notoriously terrible at it um, is a is a reason for is is the same problem for a pathologist, even if they're highly trained. Um, and, you know, someone's life is on the line, like humans are just really bad at like counting cells on a slide or like identifying how many cancer cells there might be. Um, and so there's certainly potential applications for similar technology to what we have, or even the, the algorithms that we have potentially to those spaces. But we, you know, uh, manufacturing is a huge market. There's so much here. It's a huge, big cheese that everybody can nibble on. And um, we, you know, we're remaining focused on our mission, which is to um, essentially enable customers to build better products for less. Um, by leveraging data and AI. So they're not wasting, like cut that waste in half. So they're not wasting money um, as part of bringing products to market. And then also through the production cycle for those products. Wow, yes, yes. I have seen it. Uh, my last startup in the pharmaceutical biotech industry was on uh, tox toxicity and um, histopathology and all those things. Um, so exactly, when you talked about images converted to numbers, it made so much sense. How about videos? And uh, are you able to even look at, uh, uh, you know, images in motion and make sense out of it? Because I would think that some of these things are real time, you know, processes and process improvements. Yes, yeah, so there are certainly companies in the manufacturing space that are looking at video and trying to analyze video. There's several applications where that's particularly interesting. Some would be where time and motion studies are important, like the, the way a human moves um, to actually assemble the device, does that impact its quality? Uh, so that's like kind of one group um, where, there, where there is value. The other would be where things are actually quite difficult to inspect, like for universal cosmetic judgment uh like think about looking at um like a test tube this is like not this is a simple application of like well how would you like inspect a test tube well you'd probably turn it around so you could see all the sides um and so that's like another application of video would be um to be able to improve universal cosmetics inspection which is still not does not exist 
today that is a cutting edge, like frontier um, space is to be able to actually do universal cosmetics judgment. There's certainly companies that have nipped away at parts of the space, but there is not one holistic solution today. So those are areas where video could be really impactful. Instrumental does ingest video files. The way that we've leveraged our technology there around video though is actually kind of simple. Um, you use our image products and technology to identify which units are even worth looking at. And then you can just go look at the video of that product getting assembled. And you can see like what's interesting about this video um, on a defective product. And so our customers have certainly used that for really tricky assembly steps. Um, there's one customer that has like this flexible circuit and they take like a pair of chopsticks and they twist it in a certain way. Um, and that's like how they get the um, the service loop uh, for a for a particular part, like in uh, into the device in a way that doesn't get pinched or create a short, and uh, that's a very tricky process. And so, actually, having a video of that process has enabled them to identify when shorts that they were seeing were actually caused by process versus by design of the flex or design of where the service loop is laying or other kind of um, potential issues. Quality of the flex. Um, when you have a problem, you don't know where it's coming from. Being able to eliminate these other options really quickly can be a huge value. Not many people think about waste and uh, is that, are you also into sustainability and how the planet can be more sustainable as you reduce this kind of waste? So I, I actually think this idea of leveraging data and AI to automatically improve lines, which we don't yet do, but that's our vision, um, is like, well, like the industry essentially accepts will eventually happen. Like, I actually don't think the idea is that novel. And when we started Instrumental, we had lots of people be like, oh, I had that idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, it should exist, right? So we're going to build it. Um, and it's just that nobody had built it. And I, you know, I have like, there's, a, I think the more interesting question is why hadn't that been built before? Or why if it, if people had tried, had it not been successful? And I certainly have many ideas on that front, because there are certainly many startups and even big companies, um, Predix, GE Predix being like kind of a really earlier one who sold the industry on this concept of industry 4.0 um, and how data would really revolutionize their process and yet like really under delivered in the marketplace. Um, and so kind of left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths around like, is this, you know, like, I don't know if there's going to be value in this future, but I do think that everybody believes it seems to be commonly held belief that the future of manufacturing must include data must include digitalization, must across the supply chain. So not just in semi, but like everywhere. Like, wouldn't you want your medical device to be like, have the best manufacturing processes and to be, have been built with data uh, versus not? Like, like, I think so. I think we all would want that. Um, and there's, I think the thing that's really interesting about what instrumental and kind of how instrumental is positioned its value propositions and our vision is that we operate in this really interesting intersection between like what's good for business, saving money, efficiency, improving margins, and what's good for the planet and the future, reducing waste, like not having chemicals in rivers from like extra parts that you're not shipping, like all of this, like being more efficient. And that's very motivating. It creates an interesting cross-section of people who are attracted to Instrumental, the company, but also who are attracted to the idea of using Instrumental um, because there's kind of these two pieces in that small intersection. There's like not a ton of um, opportunities to work in a business that are that exist in that intersection between what's good for business and good for the environment. And that's a win-win for everyone. Uh, so that was that's kind of an interesting part of of where we landed. I would not, I would be lying to say that like I started there. I just was always really interested in perfection as like an intellectual ideal as an engineer, like and how you would build perfect parts and efficiency. I, my mom is German. I come about it honestly, but like efficiency was always kind of something I was also interested in. So I, I came about it from that perspective. Wow. So sustainability is good business. Uh, I think it, I think it can be in this case because yeah. uh, companies like to save money <laughs> and they like to reduce waste <laughs> um, and they like to have higher gross margins. And so if those are things that matter to the business, which 
almost every business cares about those things, um, then, you know, they're good candidates for leveraging technology like instrumental to improve their processes. You have done, used a lot of new technologies at instrumental. What's the role of digital twins in the work you do? Um, so we don't have a particular opinion on digital twins. Um, we don't, we aren't doing simulation. We are doing, you are making changes to your actual line. Um, the, the way that that becomes comfortable is that we're doing so based on essentially all of the historical data that you've ever collected from that line. So you're able to understand how a change will impact your yield or your output or your throughput. Um, but it's based on looking back versus simulating a look forward. And so from our perspective, you know, I don't know that a digital twin is really, I, I'm kind of on the, on the side that that's like a buzzword. And I don't know that that's really a important piece, at least for electronics manufacturing. Um, and the way that these lines work, they go up, they go down, they change constantly, um, or they run for many, many years at a time, but they are running different SKUs with different parts and different people. Um, I think this is not the best application of digital twins. There may be other types of industries where that's really great, like in the process industry. Um, but in the discrete manufacturing space, I see, I have a hard time making that connection. And I think customers want to make decisions based on like actual data when they can. And so from that perspective, instrumental is not a digital twin. Um, and we're just essentially analyzing all of the historical data. You could, in that way, we're kind of a historian, but we're a historian with like, you know, this super smart interface on top uh, that's pulling out the useful and interesting things for you um, as they happen. Wonderful. So um, um, what I... Now I have a better understanding of what you folks do at instrumental. So would it be not, would it be appropriate to say you are AI machine learning based historians for using all the things that have happened so far to improve processes, to improve systems, to optimize use of um, uh, little components so that we minimize waste and reduce cost and things like that? Yeah, I mean, we help. We we don't we don't use the word historian, although maybe we should look into that. Um, we call ourselves a manufacturing data and AI platform, mm -hmm. um, and so pulling all that data together, using AI to um, to process the data, pulling it from places, pushing it out to places, um, leveraging other other sources of data, not always having to be the source ourselves to find insights that enable our customers to improve their entire product life cycle. So during development, there's a huge application of like finding and fixing issues. It's all about finding and fixing issues in development. And in production, it's around maintaining and continuously improving the process that you have being proactive. And so not just only looking backwards and having to have a huge history um, to be able to make a decision, but being able to use, you know, statistical process control to throw alerts and alarms that indicate like, oh, actually there's a shift happening right now that could indicate a larger problem. Like let's get in there right now before we create a huge bone pile of parts we can't ship or downtime that costs the company money. And that's how we're eliminating the waste is by just doing it right the first time or trying to do it at least the second time um, to do it right. And uh the technology you have created and are continuing to create, could it be used for completely autonomous systems such as drones or uh, you know, full self-driving vehicles and things like that? Uh, because one of the analogies of for it, change, yeah. One of the analogies of instrumental is that our vision is to be level five self-driving for manufacturing. So we call that uh, optimization autonomy. Um, so the idea is, can you build a line that essentially is, is sensitive to its own data inputs and outputs and able to actually make changes on its own autonomously to improve its own process? And our answer to that is yes, you can. Um, and I kind of alluded to like the four steps that you'd need to be able to do that. What are the problems? Why, why, are, why the problems? 
how to, you know, make a change to change that problem and then validate that the change worked and then repeat essentially over and over again in thousands of places across the supply chain at the same time at the speed of, you know, at the speed of light, which is how computers think versus at the speed of humans, which is how we operate today. Humans are very much in that loop, driving that loop today. Um, so I think the the application from like an autonomy perspective is actually we're building software that would enable autonomy in lines in the future. And that is the future that we believe is inevitable in manufacturing. Um, certainly our technology is used to build um, other systems that they themselves are autonomous, as we have um, certainly been leveraged in optical systems for LIDAR and other other components that enable autonomy in other markets and other products. Uh, how about space exploration? And uh, uh, I know those are uh, very specific applications, but uh, they seem to be increasing. Everybody wants to go to the, go to Mars. Uh, do you have systems that could improve these things on the fly in real time and things like that? Um, certainly during the manufacturing process, I think is where our scope ends. Um, although we do have customers that look at data coming back from field performance, et cetera. So there's some potential applications there around how you could leverage data coming back from the field, the field being, you know, out on our world or the field being wherever the field is out in space. Um, one of the challenges for being able to work on space and aerospace in general um, is export controls. And we know that like there's huge pain points in mission critical electronics for aerospace, defense, et cetera. And so actually Instrumental is making a serious commitment towards becoming ITAR compliant to be able to work on export controlled products where there is a, a really big need for massive amounts of quality, improved processes and efficiencies, and the return on investment to improving all of that is, is massive. Um, it's also... Um, as we were talking previous to the recording around in the semiconductor space, um, you know, I think people have previously been like, oh, well, like instrumental makes sense in semiconductor, but frankly, semiconductor has already solved many of these problems. I think there's still more to be done. There's always more to be done, but there's so much data that's being collected and opportunity there. Um, but in the making of the machines for semiconductors, uh, it's so manual. Um, and these machines and equipment, million, hundreds, tens of millions of dollars for one of these machines that has very sensitive components that go into it, um, where the manufacturing processes are incredibly manual and the yields are incredibly low. Um, and that's probably what drives the price of those machines to be so expensive. Um, and so there's certainly opportunity to be kind of working on the machines that build the machines, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. In fact, um... When uh, so you mentioned export controls and uh, the way geopolitics has been lately, but the other thing that really affected uh, manufacturing and of cars, for example, was uh, lack of parts and global supply chain issues. Uh, do you see your technology improving supply chain problems going forward? Um, so instrumental was used during, so the supply chain crunch hit more than just the automotive industry, it hit the electronics industry. Um, there was a one clock factory in the world that like got set on fire, was on fire. And so like suddenly you couldn't get clocks. Suddenly you couldn't get these chips or those chips. Like, and the lead times on these chips went to like a year. Um, and so there was a lot of post ramp qualification of different um, configurations of electronics. And so instrumental was helpful to our customers in making those post rent qualifications as smooth as possible with the lowest risk as possible um, so that they could get up and running and shipping parts again or shipping products again. Many of our customers only make money when they can make goods on their manufacturing line. So that was like a major problem. Um, certainly, as we think about supply chain in general, one of the challenges of supply chain is just that it's very, they're very centralized. They're global, but they're very centralized. And many supply chains go through parts of China or the same several suppliers. And you're trying to buy a display, like can't buy one from a company that's not South Korean. Like it's, a, um, so there's lots of centralization and kind of some of these supply chains. And I think the opportunity for instrumental is to enable our customers to build places that they might not have 
originally thought they could build. So we have customers who previously were building, doing final assembly in China, um, who decided they wanted to diversify. And so they open up a second factory in Vietnam, or you know they decide they're going to build in Mexico. So if the shipping lanes are problematic, they can at least truck parts up to the US if that's where their like main sales base is. And so actually moving factories is an incredibly risky and expensive thing for a, a company to do. Um, there's a ton of expertise into how to build these products that does not go with it when you move it to a new factory. Um, but the data is in the data record from the original factory and then what you're what you're getting from the new factory can be absolutely critical in quickly bringing up those new factories in ways that are incredibly efficient, enable customers to like keep lines running. So that's the role that instrumental has had to play during these supply chain kind of fluctuations that have been happening um, as as our customers, which are kind of global multinational electronics brands, look to diversify outside of just China into greater Asia, into Mexico, and even in some cases um, in the U.S. You know, Anna, this is the first time we are talking and I've learned so much from you. And you have such a broad, we could be talking all day long. I have one last question, and that's about uh, careers. Um, it looks like even with the startup, pace, the frenzy that you've been working at, you still kept in touch with the next generation students, encouraging them uh, in science fairs. Um, do you have any words of advice for people such as women uh, into getting into professions like manufacturing and many other areas where traditionally they were not either allowed or didn't take part? What advice would you give to somebody who is looking at what they should do next in their career? There's going to be a lot of interesting technology and development and disruption that happens in manufacturing in the next decade. This is an exciting industry to be into. Um, and then I think the other thing, this is maybe slightly uh, like we only get to change it if we if we help each other change it. Um, and so I remember being an engineer at Apple and feeling very powerless to like, why, you know, there's only two of us, like, I'm like a little engineer, like there's a huge corporation, like, how could I possibly make any impact and change the, the world around me? Um, but actually I realized I did have power, I had more power than like the students one year behind me coming out of school, like trying to figure out what they're going to do. Um, and so I think even if you feel like you haven't made it yet, you've made it compared to someone else. Um, and there's still an opportunity to reach your hand down and help pull that next person up behind you. So I would, my advice, um, is more around helping others to identify that you can reach your hand down. Even if you feel like you're not done or you're not, you haven't made it. Like you've made it compared to someone else um, who's right behind you. So I think there's a huge opportunity um, for women to help each other, for people with underrepresented backgrounds to help each other. And frankly, for the represented group to reach their hand down and pull up as well. Yes, yes. In fact, um, such an inspiring message. Uh, we will have to interview again about uh, all the things you talked about. There's so much to discuss. And to everybody listening, I'm always excited by new ideas, new technologies, and people from doing something distinctively different. So please come forward. I would love to talk to you and see how the future is going to be really exciting if we put our heads and hearts to it and make something useful out of it.